All right, so we are, I, what I did was I just kind of uh, based off of this one verse of scripture out of uh, Revelation chapter 11, I kind of started there. We're, we're going to quickly review some of that, but we'll try not to spend too much time on it. And it was out of uh, verse number 15 uh, where it talked about the, the seventh angel sounded with his trumpet. And whenever he did, it, 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 what happened was, was that there was a proclamation that went forth. And the proclamation that went forth was that the kingdoms of the earth have now become the kingdoms of our God. And so essentially what the, the point that I was trying to make and, and, and that, I, that I spoke of was that, you know, for thousands of years of human history, God, while he is sovereign, we understand that, right? What does that mean? That means that he's ultimately in control of everything that we see. He has dominion. He's in control. There's nothing that slips by his eyes. There's nothing that slips through his hand. Amen. God is in control. Nevertheless, he has allowed for thousands of years for things to continue on the earth the way that they have. And it's for a purpose. And I believe that really the purpose is also, you know, what we talked about whenever we taught the, the the book of Ephesians, the revelation that the Lord gave me was that God was creating an eternal family. Amen. He's he, through, through adoption is making us through adoption of sons, through, through giving birth. Amen. He gave birth to a nation called Israel through Abraham. Hallelujah. And through Israel, he gave us Jesus. And in Jesus, he's giving birth to a new people. And so that's much of what has been allowed to continue on this earth for all of these thousands of years of human history is to give mankind a choice, an opportunity to choose whether or not they were going to become part of the eternal family of God. He had Israel as a witness during those ancient days, amen, and he's had Christian as a witness during these days. He said, you're the light of the world, amen, but, but at the same time, evil has abounded on the earth. Evil has abounded, and, and we're going to talk about it, we'll get to it tonight, that the kings of the earth have been thrown themselves into co uh, coalition, if you will, with the evil one, Governments, false religion, all of these things have continued on. And so the earth really, I don't, have you talked to, me, to many people about Jesus? I'm just curious. I mean, since you've been a Christian, have you engaged some conversation with some people about Jesus? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I know we got a couple of people that have talked yeah. about Jesus. Yeah. Well, when I talk to people about Jesus, a lot of times what they want to know is, well, then if, if your God's so awesome, then why is this world so messed up? Because the truth of the matter is, is that this world is messed up, somebody. But that doesn't mean that God's not sovereign and in control. God allows things to continue on. But there's coming a day, according to Revelation chapter 11, this proclamation is going to come forth at the last trumpet. And when that trumpet is sounded, that last trumpet of these, of these judgments anyway, and when that last trumpet is sounded, there's a proclamation that comes forth that says that the kingdoms of this earth have become the kingdoms of our God. And when that proclamation goes forth in these next chapters, when we read in chapter 12, 13, 14, and really not, not so much 15, but 16, 17, and 18, we see a succession of events taking place that ultimately leads to God taking over and take, physically taking back this earth, if you will, and the way that he chooses to do it is by pouring judgment and wrath upon those that are still upon the earth. When we moved into chapter 12, we talked about the woman, the child and the dragon, if you'll remember that. And I have a couple of pictures that, you know, we may look at, but if you got a second, we can turn to Genesis. I just kind of want to show you why I believe that this is speaking of, of the nation of Israel um, specifically. I don't think I have to do a whole lot to convince you of that. But I think it's in Genesis. Um, let's see here. Oh, I marked it. There we go. Yeah, Genesis 37. I don't think I have to do a whole lot to convince you, but I like to show you scripture and some, some bless you. Some some people would say that this was Mary, and I don't think I have to. Like I said, I don't have to twist your arm to go with me on this. But this is where the concept that it that it speaks of Israel comes from. It was Joseph's, one of Joseph's dreams. Y'all remember Joseph, right? Mm -hmm. who, 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 who was his mom? Does anybody know who Joseph's mom was? Huh? That's right, Rachel. Who said that? You said that? <laughs> Rachel's, Rachel was Joseph's mom. She, he was her firstborn son. And um, 
Anyway, so, so Joseph had a dream and he was favored by Jacob because if you remember, Jacob loved Rachel. Amen. And, and Leah was just kind of like a thing that he was tricked into and she had him four sons. But, uh, but, Rachel, but Jacob loved Rachel and whenever she gave birth to Joseph, he was favored by Jacob and he's the one that, that, got, uh, that Jacob made that, that coat of many colors for. Mm -hmm. But he had these two dreams and, and one of the dreams it says in verse 9, and he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more and behold the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Now let's back up a second because that doesn't really tell the whole picture. Let's back up a little bit. Verse 5, chapter 37, Genesis 37, verse 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it his brethren and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. You know what a sheave is, right? That's whenever they'd go over there and, and, and they would harvest the grain and they would grab a bundle of it and they'd take a sickle. And we're going to talk about a sickle here in a little bit. And they'd cut the bottom of it and they'd pull it up and then they'd bundle it. And that was a sheave. All right. And so we were, we were doing the, we were binding sheaves in the field is what it said. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. What does that mean, obeisance? It means to worship, to bow down, right? To give reverence to. And so that shows us that Joseph's already having dreams where he's going to be elevated, and in some way his family is going to bow down to him. And so it says right here in verse 9, he dreamed another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Now, what do you think that that means? Well, I'm just going to go ahead and interpret the dream for you. The eleven stars represent his eleven brothers. And he's number 12. He's the 12th tribe in that sense. And we see that pan out in the book of Revelation. And so the sun would represent his father, amen, and the moon would represent his mother. And so now in Revelation 12, and we're not going to necessarily, well, we can, we're not going to turn there. I'm just going to tell you the story because we've got to move along. We said in Revelation 11, a proclamation goes forth. The, king, the kingdoms of the earth have become the kingdoms of our God. In Revelation 12, we saw that picture in the sky that I, I like to think of it as a, as, a, as a movie that's being played in the sky of a woman who's clothed with the sun and the moon is at her feet and she has 12 stars upon her head and she's pregnant with a male child. And what a... I mean, I went through a lot of detail last time talking about scripture, trying to prove to you who I felt like that child was through multiple scriptures. But what I'm trying to tell you is that what a beautiful picture of Israel as the woman that gives birth to Messiah. Amen. Which is a fulfillment of Joseph's dream that Israel became a nation. You know, whenever Joseph had the dream, they're just like a little family. Uh, living in, I mean, you know, they had other people with them that had come with Abraham and they had been multiplying, but yet they were still sheep herders. You understand? They had not been given their land yet. They had not become a nation yet. That they had, we're not even talking, this isn't even the time frame of, of Moses yet. Moses isn't for another 400 years after that. And so, and so, Nevertheless, Joseph's dream comes true, and I believe that this is telling us in chapter 12 of a history, if you will, of salvation history of Israel giving birth to Messiah and this red dragon that desires to devour her and to devour her male child. And that yet he's brought up to heaven when he ascended. Amen. And it's the plan of salvation that we see that there's a war that's been raging. And so if this proclamation was made in chapter 11, what we're seeing now is we're seeing a picture for, on the first end of chapter 12 of the overall plan of salvation, I believe. And then in the last part of chapter 12, we're told that Satan attempts to, to exalt himself in the heavenly realm again. And, and listen, he already tried it once and the age has passed, you know, long before the fall of man, long before the creation of man, Satan, and according to Isaiah 14, attempted to exalt himself above the throne of God. Jesus, when he was the word who spoke the world into existence, said that I saw Satan fall like lightning to the earth. Does that make sense to you what I just said? Mm -hmm. 
Jesus was the eternal word that spoke the worlds into existence. Y'all remember that? Uh -huh. That's when he would have saw Satan fall to the ground, right? And so, but yet there's a time in the future whenever he will attempt to elevate himself again. Mm -hmm. And he will try to go into heaven and fight him and his angels against Michael and his angels and he will prevail not. And he will be cast down again, no more to go to heaven, no more to accuse you before your father. Amen. And that's what he does. He accuses you. He accuses me. Each and every time we mess up, each and everything that we do wrong, he's the accuser of the brethren. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And, and listen, but there's a day whenever he's going to be thrown out and he's not going to be allowed to even come give an account for what he's doing. And the Bible says that at that day, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for he, cut, he knows that his time is short and he comes to you with great wrath. And so he's going to be coming down and he's going to be causing much chaos. And so we see something that happens in the spiritual realm. And we know that in the book of Revelation, when things happen in the spiritual realm, we see a mirror image or in some way a correlation in the physical realm on the earth. In chapter 13, what we saw was the unholy trinity. Remember that? I had a, and we'll go through the pictures real quick. But we showed we had an unholy trinity. And what we, what we saw was that there was two beasts that chapter 13 speaks of. One beast is the Antichrist. He's a government ruler. The other beast is a false prophet. He's able to call fire down from heaven. And because of his wonders, the inhabitants of the earth. Listen to me. I'm telling you right now that, that, that much of the church is so deceived right now by the, by the false gospel that's being preached. That people, I'm telling you, Lord, help us if the Lord tarries and we see any type of movement by by really the a false Christ of any nature. It's going to be it's already so deceptive. Yes, it is. The, the, the way that things are. Listen to me. How are you going to convince somebody that what the modern church is doing is wrong whenever all they're doing is helping people in this social gospel? You understand what I'm saying? They're feeding the hungry. They're clothing people that don't have clothes. And they're doing all of these wonderful things to help the community, besides the fact that they hired an Easter bunny. We won't talk about that. But, but, but besides the fact that they hired an Easter bunny, you know that's pagan worship, right? I'm just letting you know. Father-in-law tried to tell me that a long time ago. I wouldn't listen to him. Should have listened to some of that stuff that man was saying. But anyway, it's pagan worship. Okay, but, but nevertheless, besides that, that over here trying to outreach in the community... But at the same time, have changed the gospel, have diluted the gospel and not teach. Oh, yeah, the churches are packed. I'm telling you, you can't find a seat anywhere whenever you go look for a seat. But they've changed the gospel, the glorious gospel. They don't know. They no longer will tell people how they were saved by the blood of the lamb. They'll no longer tell them that there's only one way to walk and it's through the blood of the lamb. And I'm here to tell you that you can't have a social gospel and a diluted gospel and think that it's going to work together. It doesn't work that way. No. Lord, help us. Help the preacher to preach the truth. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And, and listen, I'm just telling you, this false prophet it's, and this spirit of Antichrist is already at work in the midst of the church. Yes. And not everybody's doing it on purpose. Not everybody is, is, is purposefully preaching a false gospel. Many of the, many, most people are deceived. Yes. Deceived by lying spirits. And they don't realize it. And it probably, you know what? It probably doesn't help, help to have people like me to try to tell them. I'm just going to say it. Because people like me, I mean, Lord help me. I'll probably come across as arrogant. I'll probably come across the wrong way. I sure, sure tried, though. I tried to tell a lot of people a lot of things. Tried to warn them. God bought books for them. I, I did it. I'm going to say it to the camera. I know some of you still watch. I tried to, I tried to warn people that, there, that there's a false gospel that's brewing. You hear me? Coming from California on the coast and it's spreading through pulpits across the land. Mm -hmm. yep. And people are blind to it because you know what? They're doing good stuff. That's right. Lord help us. Anyway, that's what chapter 13 was about. It was about a two beasts. One was an antichrist, which is a government ruler. The other one was a false prophet and then the dragon. They received their power from the dragon. So we're going to be getting into chapter 14 tonight, which is the judgment of God and the reaping of the earth. And then in chapter 16, I mean, I'm going to go through it here in a second, but just give me a second. Chapter 16, we're going to see about these lying demon spirits that are going to drive the world's armies towards Armageddon. 
In chapter 17, we see the Antichrist system. And in chapter 18, we see the destruction of financial Babylon. So I'm not going through this in detail. We've already taught a lot of this in detail. But we're just going to kind of do it more as an overview. But remember, the main concept of what we're talking about is, is that a proclamation has gone forth. And that the kingdoms of this earth have become the kingdoms of our God. And now it's thrown something into action where something in the spiritual realm has taken place. And now we're beginning to see things happening in the physical realm. Now, what I had here was a picture of a baby. And that goes back to chapter 12. And it goes back to the image that we spoke of with this woman who was clothed with the sun and the 12 stars, which was Israel. And this epic battle that's taken place between the dragon and his desire to destroy the woman Israel and also her to destroy Jesus, but also to destroy her seed after that. He desires to destroy every professing Christian that would walk the face of the earth. And that was the unholy trinity we spoke of. And I use that picture right there just because I would expect that it would look something like that. That's what I'm kind of expecting. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm ex I mean, I hope you don't get mad at me. I think it's going to be a world ruler. That's what the Antichrist is going to be. And a false prophet. And I just can't think of a better one for it to be than the current Pope. I mean, I may be wrong. That's what I think too. Uh, but I mean, look, he, he, once again, do a little bit of research on Jesuitism. We're about to get into it actually here in a little bit in the next few weeks. But anyway, I expect it to look something like that. So keep your eyes open. We also talked about the fact that God has been moving throughout human history. Amen. Bringing mankind towards the new heavens and a new earth. Bringing mankind through Israel as a witness. Giving us Jesus in the church. Building the kingdom of God and at the same time the enemy through mystery Babylon through through mystery religions What is mystery religion? What does that even mean? It, it, it includes paganism. It started with Bab It started with Nimrod at the Tower of Babel and Semiramis his wife, but it includes every false way and false religion that has ever existed on the face of the earth Mysticism has crept in Listen to me, Buddhism, Islam, Catholicism. Sufism, Catholicism, yes. mystical religion, yes. not just Catholicism, Protestantism. Yes. And Protestantism right now, Paula White, listen, y'all heard her name before. Mm -hmm. Paula White is all about contemplative prayer. They tried to get her to denounce it and she wouldn't do it. Contemplative prayer, it's a form of meditation. Yep. That engage, that you empty the mind. See, when you meditate Christian-wise, I said it. Y'all need to do y'all's own research, people on the camera, if you're going to get mad at me. Listen to me. Whenever you meditate on the Word of God, what you do is you put the Word of God in your heart and in your mind and you think about it. You understand that? You become a thinker. Right. Yes. You, you chew on the Word. But contemplative prayer, what it does is, is it tells you to take a Word and it becomes a mantra. That's Eastern mystic, mystical Buddhist prayer. Mm -hmm. and, the earth, and the church fathers in Catholicism practiced it too. They call them the desert fathers. Mm -hmm. and, and Ignatius Loyola, who started the Jesuit priesthood, did it too. And what they do is, is that they find a word, and it can be Jesus. Do you remember Paul said, even if they preached another Jesus... Come on. Just because it's got the name Jesus don't mean it's the right one. Right. Then you repeat that name over and over and over again. Even if it's a good word, you just keep repeating it. Vain repetitions. Wow. And you keep repeating it until finally you come to a place where the mind is emptied. And you're just in the midst of tranquility and nothingness. And what you're supposed to be doing is you're opening yourself up for entrance of a spirit of another kind. Yeah. This is being taught in Protestant churches. This is being taught by mainstream Protestant non-denominational people. And most people don't even know what, 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 what it, what's going on about. And, and, and I'm, just, I'm just letting you know, that is mystery religion. That is mystery Babylon. It's every deception from the enemy in any way, shape, or form that he can close our eyes, deafen our ears, and blind our hearts to the truth. But in chapter 14, there's an angel that begins to preach, and that's where we're going to start. It says in, in, in chapter 14 and verse 6, that I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, 
having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now you got to understand, there's been billions of people that have died at this point. And people still refuse to repent. And now this angel begins to preach. Now one thing that you got to understand is, is that God during the church age has not used angels to preach the gospel. He's used mortal man. I know I'm telling you right now, the enemy can laugh all he wants to. He can laugh at fallen man all he wants to. But there's something that's, that I know it just got to frustrate him. That God would use broken down mortal clay and he would allow it to preach forth the truth of the gospel with power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And that that power yeah. would reach into other people and set the captive free. Yeah. And it's more powerful than what he is. Don't let the devil lie to you. Even though sometimes you find yourself struggling and you find yourself not doing what it is that you want to do. Don't let the devil lie to you because contained within you, if Jesus is contained within you is more power hallelujah yeah. he that is in you is more is greater than he that is in the world amen yeah. so you hold on to jesus and i know that it gives the devil fits god during the church age has not used angels to preach but once the church age is over there's an angel that's preaching but look at what his message is it says fear god verse seven and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Same message that was in Romans chapter 1 that spoke about the Gentile nations. That even though they knew he was God, they refused to worship him that way. Not even preaching about the lamb right here. He said, get your eyes off the beast. Get your eyes off the beast and the dragon. Get your eyes off the one that's trying to get you to put that mark in your hand. Turn your eyes if you hadn't got the mark, that is. Turn your eyes back to the creator of heavens and earth and all that in them is. Amen. And, and, and you got maybe you might have a chance. Even though martyrdom is, is, is close, is fast approaching. Yeah. It goes on to say that the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon them. And, 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 the, and that the smoke of their torment will, be, will rise up for, forever and ever. But look at verse uh, 15. It talks about in verse 15, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Well, let's go back to verse 14. Sorry. I looked and behold a white cloud. This is Revelation 14, 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. This is Jesus. Jesus has got a golden crown. He's on a cloud. He's got a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So remember the proclamation in chapter 11. What did it say? The kingdoms of the earth have now become the kingdoms of our God. And now, essentially, the earth, because I used to struggle with this passage of scripture. Like, what does this mean, Lord? I, I got to tell you, I've read it. I've studied it. And it always in my spirit, I always felt like it meant a literal interpretation. Reap the earth. And when you look at it in context of chapter 11, that's what's happening. The kingdoms of the earth are now becoming the kingdoms of our God. But the way that he's reaping it is through judging the unrepentant man. Yeah. And that's the first thing that's happening is that judgment is falling upon unrepentant man. But at the same time, God is reaping the earth. That's what a sickle is. It's a tool that's used for harvest in order to reap the harvest. And so we see there that would be kind of like a little small piece. He's working on a sheave like Joseph did right there. And, and but it goes on to say right here in verse 17, we'll keep reading. Well, verse 16, and he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth. And the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now, one of the things that I wanted you to notice is, is that it's talking about gathering the, the, the vine of the earth versus you remember in John 15, what did it say in John 15? 
said, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branch. And so those that are believers of the Lord are connected to him. Amen. He's the vine. We remain connected to him through faith in him and what he did. Amen. And through him, we gain our power and our strength. But these are the vines of the earth. And it says in verse 19, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. So we see two things, at least the way that I'm seeing it happening here. Number one, Jesus is reaping the earth. He is going to be the king of kings and the Lord. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But he's going to physically one day rule and reign from Jerusalem as the king of kings and lord of lords. And this is the beginning of that process. This is not even happened yet. This is this is telling us that Armageddon is coming. You understand what I'm saying? And that's this is this is all a foreshadowing of what's going to happen. This is all talking about the wrath that's about to fall upon unrepentant man. And this is speaking of Armageddon. And the wine press was trodden without the city and blood came out of the wine press even to the horse, horse's bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred fur, 1,600 furlongs, which is about 200 miles. But so I got a couple of pictures here. This is, this is how they would stomp grapes back in the day. So you could about imagine. So what we're talking about is, is that unrepentant man are those grapes in that vat right there. And they're being trodden and being judged and being judged by God. And now you can see why they call it the wine press. Isn't that something? Doesn't that look like blood? That wine coming out of there? But you see this right here. It talks about, it talks about um, blood to the bridles of the horses for 200 miles. Some people have said that they believe that that's hy hyperbolic language, meaning an over-exaggeration to make a point. I mean, the book of Revelation is a lot of allegory in it. But for the most part, you're supposed to try to interpret literally where you can. And so one point that I do want to make, I can't tell you whether or not there's really going to be blood all the way to the horse's bridle. Do I believe that God can make it happen? Absolutely. And I'm about to tell you what, why I believe that that's the case. It may be hyperbolic language to make a point that there's going to be the greatest bloodshed ever known to man. Okay, that's a good way to say it. Uh, but if you look at uh, Revelation 16:21. It says right there, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. So my point to all of that was, is that, uh, and I, I got my slides a little bit mixed up, but that those those stones of hail weigh about 100 to 125 pounds apiece. Now if you can imagine... Hail coming down like that. All of these people, I'm about to tell you, I'm about to show you, the armies are going to converge. And the reason why they're going to converge is because God's going to deem it to happen that way. And all these armies are going to converge in this one place called Armageddon Valley. And, there, and there's going to be a huge slaughter of humanity that's going to take place. And at the same time that this slaughter is taking place, hailstones, the weight of 100 to 125 pounds are going to be falling. And all that's going to be melting. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that you're going to have a big old mess. Yeah. And certainly there's the possibility that the blood would be to the horse's bridles is the point that I was trying to make with that. All right. Now it, uh, it talks about in chapter 16, we're going to transition to chapter 16. And in verse 12, it says the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So if you turn to Daniel chapter 11, or you don't, I mean, if you don't want to, you don't have to, I'll read it to you. Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 through 44, seems to talk about this time whenever all, see, a lot of people think that the, that the kingdom of Antichrist is going to have dominion over the entire earth, but it almost seems like the reality is, is that there's going to be some countries that try to come against them. And nevertheless, though, all of these people are going to be led to this one spot where God is going to lead them to for the very end. It says in verse 40, 
And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, talking about Antichrist. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, talking about Israel. And many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, talking about Edom, Moab, and the, and the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away with many. So it sounds as though he's having his way with the majority of these nations. He's at war with them. And at the same time, all of a sudden, some news from the east comes his way and it diverts his attention. So all of this stuff is happening at the same time. And, and this is this war that's taking place. And in the book of Revelation right here, what we're about to say, it, well, what I just told you is, is that in verse 12, it says, The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east may be prepared. Now, you remember when we taught on the first six trumpets, we said that there was a 200 million man army, right? And 200 million of these demonic spirits that were released. Remember when we talked about that, that the, that a star fell from heaven. It was talking about Satan. He was given a key. Remember that he unlocked the abyss. What happened? Locusts and demon spirits came yeah. out and there was an angel that was over them. That's how we knew it weren't helicopters. People used to try to say that was helicopters. No, it ain't helicopters because they had a fallen angel over them. His name was Abaddon or Apollyon, which is yeah. the great destroyer. Yeah. He's released. He's one of them angels of old that crossed boundaries that they weren't supposed to and lied with the daughters of men. That's another story for another time. But the point is, is that these demonic spirits are all, it, 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 we, we're told that it's a 200 million army. And so I believe that the right interpretation is there's, that many of these demonic spirits that are operating and influencing also a physical army coming from the east. I told you Time Magazine, I think it was 1965, May 30th, shooting from the hip, said, China said we have a 200 million man army. And so what it says right here is, is that the, the river Euphrates is going to be dried up and that the kings from the east might be prepared to come over. I had my globe and here's China right here. And so basically what happens is, is that it, I know this looks like water right here, but it's not. It's Afghanistan and Iran. They can march straight across right there. And then you got the Tigris and the Euphrates River. And so, you know, if you're going to get an army over there, that's the point. I mean, I know that there's other ways for it to be done but nowadays. But nevertheless, 200 million men is a lot of people. And so that's what it says right there. And let's see here. It says... But look at verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So what I want you to see here is that these these. Spirits, these frogs that are coming out of the dragon's mouth, coming out of the beast's mouth. Basically, the beast is the Antichrist. You remember that? Right. And he's and what did Daniel say a long time ago? We learned this. I hope you remember. He speaks in riddles because I've, I've repeated myself multiple times and only so that I can talk to you and you know what I'm talking about. He speaks in riddles. So he says one thing on the front end, but then there's something else. And that's what demon spirits do. They tell you one thing, but they're really meaning something else to try to deceive and to, and to, throw, you, to throw you off path and to get you headed in the right direction. And what ends up happening, though, is that, is that these demon spirits are enticing the kings of the earth to come to this one locale. But the whole time, God is the one that's orchestrating the whole event to get all of these people to one place so that the wine press of the wrath of God is about to go down on unrepentant man because he refuses to bow his knee to God and the Christ that God had sent. Amen. Which was Amen. Jesus and his death on the cross to, to save mankind that he might be part of God's eternal family. And listen, this isn't the first time that God's allowed this kind of thing to happen. 
In 1 Kings chapter 22, the story of Ahab. Y'all remember King Ahab, right? There was another king from Judah named Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat came up and he was visiting with Ahab and they were hanging out in Samaria. Both had their little thrones set up. And what happened was, was that Ahab said, let us go fight against Syria. And Jehoshaphat said, hold on a second, because Ahab's already worshiping false gods. And Jehoshaphat is trying to hold on to the real God a little bit. He said, don't you have a prophet that we can inquire of to make sure that this is what the right move we should do? And Ahab says, well, sure, I got all kinds of prophets. And he called 400 of his prophets over. You remember, you remember Elijah had a showdown with those prophets. <laughs> He calls those prophets over there, and after Jehoshaphat hears that, he's like, man, is there not another prophet that we can listen to? In other words, he knew these are nothing but a bunch of lying prophets. They're not telling you the truth. He said, well, there's one more. His name is Micaiah. I can't stand him because he never says anything. It's not spelled like Micah. It's spelled like Micaiah. I always thought it was Micah, but I looked at it. It's not. It's Micaiah. And he, said, he says, uh, he doesn't ever say anything good for me. And so next thing you know, they said, okay, are you going to speak good for the king? And he says, go on up and take the, take your enemy. The Lord's going to make them, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, bread for you. Go on. And they knew he wasn't telling the truth, but he was telling them what they wanted to hear. Why, why won't you tell us the truth? And so then he tells them. And then now Ahab's mad. And what Micaiah tells him is this. He says, you know what I saw in the spirit? He said, I saw the Lord and the host of heaven that were at his side. And the Lord said, how... Whom shall I send? Basically, the idea is to bring confusion to Ahab. How, whom shall I send to bring confusion to Ahab to cause him to go in the wrong direction so that he might be destroyed? Because, see, he didn't want to hear what God had to say. And all of a sudden, the spirit came and said, I will go. And the Lord asked him, how will you do it? He said, I will go to him as a lying spirit. And I will tell him what basically he wants to hear. And then he will be sent. So this isn't going to be the first time what I'm trying to tell you that God will allow lying spirits to be used for his own purposes. He will, if, if, if these people want to hear, we're going to show up at the battle of Armageddon and we're going to get what's coming to us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you are. And, and, and God knows how to accomplish and to get done what it is. That he desires to get done. So the Euphrates River will be drawn, dried up. And the armies will be drawn into the, ba into the valley. This is just a picture of, um, of the Euphrates River. And I was just trying to, to show you the Euphrates River. And that China. Really and truly I probably should have drawn my line. Because they can just walk straight across. They don't have to go through the Caspian Sea right there. So I was just trying to show you a little bit of geography. That you can see it. Now this, this picture here. I'm trying to get into the, to, a little bit to the Valley of Armageddon. I'm just trying to show you a couple of maps just so you can get a picture of it. The Valley of Armageddon is also called Megiddo, and it's also called the Jezreel Valley. And basically, it comes from the area of Mount Carmel, which is where Elijah had to show down with the prophets, all the way to this Mount Gilboa. So it, it takes up that, that stretch of land right there. And uh, I got a couple of better pictures here. And so there's one more picture of it. But I like this one. This must be a, like a Google Earth map because yeah. it looks it looks so real. I guess that's what it is. I don't know. But here's the Mount Carmel Mountains. Here's the, the this is where it stretches forth. The, the Valley of Arm, uh, the, the Valley of Armageddon or Jezreel Valley. And this is the Jordan River that runs along the side. You remember that? This is the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea is way down here. And so that's the Jordan River that runs through that I always draw. But here's the valley right here where all of these nations will come together. And so it's almost kind of like, I hate to say it, but it's like a little bit of a soup bowl that's preparing. Like, could you imagine 200 million people? Just That's just one army from the east being in that one spot and all this slaughter taking place. And this just shows all the different nations that are going to come there. And we've already talked about that. And we already read Daniel 11. But I was just thinking that that's probably kind of like what it would look like. And uh, that, that's the scripture that talks about the hail. And I told you that it weighed 125 pounds. And there's a picture out of my Bible app that just says that it, a talent is about 125 pounds. And that's another picture of the horses that, where the blood's coming up to the, uh, to the bridles. And that's the scripture that I was telling you about, about the 200 million men army. Now, real quick. 
Revelation 17, and I'm going to just close. Just give me five more minutes. I went a little later tonight than I wanted to. So. <laughs> All right, Revelation 17 talks about the Antichrist system. We've talked about that before. So the seven heads, you, you can go back and read it for yourself later. Well, let's just go ahead and read the first three verses. It says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You know, I, I think I need to stop right here just for a second. And I got to tell you that this, this great whore represents Babylonian mystery religion. And part of Babylonian mystery religion, like I said, is the lies that have entered into the Protestant church. And you may not realize it, but... It's demonic spirits that try to tell people to serve God through a works-based message. It's demonic spirits that tell people to try to serve God through a social-based gospel. Amen. And when you sit under that and you allow yourself to be fed that, <laughs> what ends up happening is, is that the lying spirits begin to drive you, blind you, intoxicate you. Yeah. To the point where you can't see the truth. Amen. You're being blinded by lying spirits of religion that are saying one thing and they even say the name Jesus and they even use the word cross from time to time. But they're not telling you how to keep your faith in the finished work of the Lord that, will em that it will empower you and give you the grace that you need to walk right with him. Amen. And that no matter what you're going through and no matter what you're struggling with, that if you'll keep your faith in squarely placed in the Lord, victory will come. And, and guess what? The struggle will end. Amen. And the Lord's grace will be there to heal. Amen. And the Lord's grace will be there to restore. Amen. And the Lord's grace will be there to mend. Amen. Amen. And there's only one way to get it. Hallelujah. And it's by faith in God's plan. That's it. I'm sorry if it don't seem like it's working today. You better keep believing it tomorrow. I'm sorry if it looks like it didn't work tomorrow. You better still believe it in next week. Yeah. And you better hold on to it till you have no more breath left in your lungs. Because it's the plan of God. Amen. 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 But there's a harlot. She's riding the back of this seven-headed beast, which represents the kingdoms of the earth, false government that have been allowed by God, but have been instituted by Satan, that have been galloping the course of human history, and now false religion is riding its back. This is the Antichrist system. And in chapter 18, I'm closing, it talks about financial Babylon. So when it comes to the Antichrist system, we have, we have and I had it on that slide, we have governments, that's the seven-headed beast, we have religion, that's Mystery Babylon, that's the harlot that rides the beast. And we have a financial system. We're going to learn more about that in the upcoming weeks. But what I want you to see is that this has been the Antichrist system. This is the ways of the world. Religion, finance, government. And I'm telling you, it is so much more organized than you would have ever dreamed in a million years. The enemy has infiltrated all levels of society and he's driving mankind in a certain direction. But there's coming a day, according to Revelation 18, when that city called Babylon, financial Babylon, will be brought to ruin. It will be destroyed. Hallelujah. Right. And it says that the kings of the earth, in chapter, chapter 18, verse 3, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. What does that mean? That means powerful people have, been in, have, have walked in unison with false religion, corrupt governments, and through finance and power and money have ruled the world. Yes. But there's coming a day when God's going to destroy it. And God's going to expose it. And when you see kings, I don't know about you, but I, I did this for a purpose because I'm trying to help you out a little bit. Because, see, when I read passages like that and I read the word king, there ain't even no kings left. I mean, there may be one. I don't know. In Saudi Arabia, they might call him a king. 
But you get my point. When I think of a king, I think of some guy wearing stockings and this little goofy crown right here. But what I need you to understand is, is that, yes, there were kings back in those days that threw their lot in with Satan. There's no question yeah. about it. Yeah. Satan's been using mankind for a long time. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, is that I believe that it gets a little, and I've talked to you a little bit about it. I'm not going on. I'm closing. I promise. This is, this is one of them Rothschild guys. Owns the banking industry. All right. This is, uh, this is George Soros. He works for the Rothschilds. He's a multi, multi-billionaire. These people, according to, now listen, you, they get mad at me. I mean, I'm just a little guy from South Louisiana. This is a YouTube video. They have about 15 people watching anyway most of the time, so I ain't got too much to worry about. But, you know, the truth of the matter is, is this, is that these people, according to some, the reports of some, are Luciferians. Yes. Now, I don't know what that does for you. Do you realize, what did, what did it mean to you whenever Satan took Jesus on a mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the earth? You thought that was just all a play for us just to read and not think it was real? Mm -hmm. Showed him the kingdoms of the earth and said, all these I will give unto thee. All you have to do is bow your knee. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't bow his knee, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Because there's light, amen. There's light to be grasped to. And I know that if you put your faith in him, you know what I'm talking about. Jesus didn't bow his knee to him, but countless others have. And they have been given wisdom that's not earthly yes. in order to move the world in a certain direction. This is one of the Rockefellers. And this is, I think the History Channel did a series on these guys, Carnegie, Rockefeller, and Harriman. And there's a whole lot more to the story, really, than meets the eye is what I'm trying to say. But there was a real king, amen? amen. And he came lowly and riding amen. on a donkey. And that's why everybody's missing it. Everybody's missing the whole thing because it looks silly to them whenever they're looking for something with prestige and pomp right. and circumstance. And Jesus comes lowly and riding in on it. I don't know about you, but I know the Lord's been showing me some stuff here lately. You know what, Matt? You're full of, you are full of pride. You think you humble, you think you got something figured out, you are full of pride. You don't look nothing like Jesus. And the fact of the matter is, is this, is that he'd speak the same thing and he wants to, because he wants his people to be humble. I don't need to speak that to you. That's what the, that's what the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. He's showing me that sometimes you think that you're something when in reality you're not. And sometimes God's got to allow things to happen in your life to show you where you are so that he can, re he, he can fix some things going on in your life. Amen. 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 Hey, hallelujah. Look, he's not done with you. He's going to keep working on you. If you call yourself his, he's not going to quit on you. Amen. Amen. And so look, man, we're going to hold on to Jesus.